This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This lecture concerns the important topic of quality management. It may be that since you studied the lower exam on audit and assurance, some of the jargon has changed, so be careful with the changes. There are three standards that affect quality management. Notice the word is management, not control. And the three standards, again, are first of all, ISQM 1 and 2, International Standard on Quality Management 1 and 2. These apply to the whole firm. They does not just apply to audits, it would apply to other assurance engagements. For example, reviewing interim financial statements or reviewing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, reviewing the assumptions in a cash flow forecast. So it's much wider than the individual audit. And these standards, again, apply at the firm level. ISQM1 sets out the basic concepts needed that the firm needs to comply with. ISQM2 is more concerned with one specific aspect, and that is engagement quality reviews. Some of you may be familiar with the term hot review. Well, ISQM2 is concerned with hot reviews, if you know that language. The final standard is a standard for each individual audit engagement. So the engagement partner on each individual audit has to be familiar with ISA 220 and that is dealing only with audit on an engagement by engagement basis. You might think that's all a bit complicated. I'll show you a way to simplify it in a couple of minutes. ISQM1, first of all, sets down the objectives of quality management. And the key words that you can see highlighted are to ensure that the firm has a system in place so things are happening more or less automatically, not on an ad hoc basis, a system in place to be sure that they can get reasonable assurance Number one, that there is compliance with standards, auditing standards, ethical standards, accounting standards, and with legal and regulatory requirements, so individual legislation in particular countries. So the firm has complied with standards and legal requirements, and also that the report issued by the firm is appropriate that has been the opinion and so on has been thought about and is in line with the work that's been done and the conclusions that have been reached. So there is my objective of quality management. Within quality management, you have a number of different components. And when we come across here, we've got something that looks a bit like a spaceship. And you might look at this and you might say, well, I can't learn visually. I don't know. Some of you probably like this. It is in the um, standard. It's not something that we've made up. So you might quite like it, even though it looks like a spaceship. If, like me, you tend to learn things by just learning words in lists, I've tried to pick out the components on the right-hand side. You'll notice that ISQM1 has got eight components. Now, individual audits, as in ISA 220, six components, but ISQM1 has got eight. The extra two are at the bottom, a risk assessment process and information and communication. I would try and learn the names particularly because some of the names have changed. So, for example, over the last year or so, monitoring 
is no longer just monitoring, it's monitoring and remediation. If you like mnemonics, you could use LEARM, L-E-A-R-E-M, for the basic six components that are in both quality standards. Um, but then you've got the extra two, R and I, also in ISQM1. The firm is under obligation to look at the whole system of quality management and review it every year. In the notes, I've put into a box the ones that are unique to ISQM1. There's risk assessment process. And a bit later, there's information and communication very much at the firm level. But let's just remember and think about what each of these components mean. Risk assessment is, of course, important. If I run an airline, I would have an objective, again, that my um, I don't have passengers on the plane who are drunk. So I might have controls where the staff are working the looking at the way in which the passengers aboard the plane because there's a risk they could cause damage. We're not an airline, are we? We're an audit firm. But the same process applies. What are the objectives? What are the risks? And what response could we have? An example of a quality objective would be to make sure the ethical standards are complied with. A risk would be that inadvertently audit staff have got shares in the client that they're auditing. So the response, the control, would be to ask the audit staff to complete a questionnaire. The questionnaire again, do you have shares in this in clients, which clients, and then we can keep them off the job. So there should be that formal risk assessment process in place in the firm as a whole. Secondly, leadership. But notice it doesn't just say leadership, it says governance and leadership. I think there's a history of having a quality control partner in the basement. What we're now saying is it needs to be brought to the forefront of the firm. It needs to be part of the governance so the very senior partners need to promote a culture, making sure that leadership, again, has appropriate authority. Ethical requirements. We just had an example. Things like a two-way ethics questionnaire. Confirming with all clients that we will only take them on or continue to service them if we're satisfied with their integrity, if we're satisfied that we're able to perform the engagement, if, for example, the client has not outgrown the auditor, we must confirm that engagement performance is appropriate by the way that we direct the, 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 all the, the assignments, by having proper planning meetings, supervise what's going on, perhaps reassigning staff on occasions if they're out of their depth and a continual process of review. When we think about resources being appropriate, it's not just human resources now. You've got the human resource, obviously. So do I have appropriate people? Am I using the right person on the right job within the audit? But we've got a lot of IT or technological resource, in particular, when we're using audit software to analyze the client data. So is the software appropriate? I think of intellectual resources of things like books. So is the audit firm's um, audit approach manual up to date? Plus, of course, have we had updates on changes to auditing and accounting standards? You could use a little mnemonic for resources, if you like, which is HIT, human, intellectual and technological. Information and communication at the firm level. That, of course, is partly within the firm, but also 
via the clients as well. So it's making sure that the highest tier of management of the audit firm are communicating with those charged with governance and the client so that we can confirm effectively again that everyone is in the loop as to what's happening and what the problems are. And finally, monitoring and remediation. Remediation is new in this standard. So when we notice problems in quality control, for example, perhaps we've got some staff who have not been pulling their weight, that we do something about it. Rather than just saying the person is rather lazy, we do something to invigorate them or retrain them for their future work. So eight components there of quality control. The newer ones, risk assessment and information and communication. Possible mnemonic for the rest, Lirum. But these words, we need to try and use them when we're looking at a scenario question. When we look at a scenario, I've just made a little scenario up up here just to show you the way in which I would write. Perhaps you found out in the scenario that the audit junior is in charge of the audit of derivatives. And we all understand that's not a good plan because they won't understand derivatives, they won't understand the accounting, and as you've seen in strategic business reporting, the accounting is extremely complex. Now, don't say this is poor quality management. That's no good. Say why it's poor quality management. So think about the words, leadership, ethics, resources, and so on. I've said it shows poor use of resources and explain why. It's be derivatives are complex. That's a good enough reason, isn't it? Remember, most audit risk, or a lot of it, comes back to things being complex or things being judgmental. But there we have ISQM1. ISQM2 deals with a specific stage in the quality management process. And that's the engagement quality review, which is required for listed and other high-risk clients. Sometimes, historically known as the HOT review, the concept is that where you have these particular jobs, a second partner will come in, have a look at everything, decide whether everything necessary has been done, that they would have reached the same conclusion before the audit opinion is signed. And in practice, where clients are very high risk, it's not uncommon to have two hot reviews because the firm wants to be absolutely sure um, of things before they sign off on the audit report. We need to make sure that the person who does the reviewing is A, independent, and B, is going to be useful. So you can see these words I've highlighted with green letters. Remember the mnemonic CAT. Are they competent? Do they have authority? And above all, do they have time? There's been some gossip in the financial press about these second reviews being done in half an hour, which is probably just gossip, but we need to make sure that proper resources are allocated. So the person doing it, competence, authority and time or cat. You need to appreciate what sorts of things are in the review. It's hard to learn a list like this, isn't it? But if you learned the, the, the words I've just numbered off here, that would give you plenty, I think. So if you are the second partner with competence, authority and time, you'll be looking at the financial statements, the audit report, the judgments, the conclusions, and with listed companies to confirm the firm is in a, a, a position of independence. We don't, for example, want the firm to be 
preparing the accounts and then auditing them. And obviously that would be in breach of ethical standards. So look at the accounts, the report, judgments, conclusions, and again, finally, again, independence. As it says in your notes here, historically, a hot review. Firms also carry out cold reviews. And all firms will do that. And they will do it on a cyclical basis. On a cyclical basis, they'll work their way down the partners and have a look at reports that they've produced. But this will be after the audit report has been signed. And often there are specialist teams to do that. So that is ISQM1 and ISQM2. ISQM1 had eight components of quality management at the firm level. ISQM2 was specifically about one of those components. Finally, ISA 220. Well, it looks very similar to ISQM1, except there are only six components. So again, you can stick with this mnemonic, Lirum, if you like it. But appreciate, please, the thrust of, ISQ, of, of um, ISA 220 is to talk specifically to the engagement partner on the individual audit. Imagine their name is Brian or Samantha. And this standard says, Brian or Samantha, I'm talking to you. And this is what you need to do when you take responsibility for the audit of Boxo. And you can see similar words to in ISQM1, obviously, but the individual audit stage. The objectives are the same. Confirm that the, the, the audit complies with standards and legal requirements. Confirm the report is appropriate. And then, um, there are your components in the same way. Everything coming back to the engagement partner. Leadership, ethics, the ethics questionnaire, acceptance, making sure the client has integrity, making sure there are no conflicts of interest with other clients, resources, human, intellectual and technological. The same words again, performance, direction, supervision and review. I want to pause on the word review does the engagement partner have to review everything? No. And now that we are often using audit software, where thousands of transactions have been analysed, it would just be counterproductive, a waste of time. It would, nothing would ever get done. So the standard is specific about the things that should be reviewed, that are things involving, you guessed it, judgment. So examples here how they got to materiality. Five to 10% of profit before tax, perhaps. Then a decision to actually use 5% because a particular client has got specific problems. And then the setting of level of things like performance materiality for individual audit tests. The way in which the firm has responded to significant risks. Not all risks, but significant. Remember the spectrum of audit risk. The significant ones are the ones that have a high impact, most likely to occur. The work done, ongoing concern, because that could have an impact on the individual um, accounts, perhaps disclosure of going concern, maybe even preparation of the accounts on a breakup basis. So be aware, please, of the structure of the three standards, which recently reissued for the first time for a very, very long time, because it's a very, very topical issue. So you know the six components of ISA 220, the two extra ones of ISQM1, and for a practical question, we're able to apply things by linking a scenario to a specific part of the quality management standard, 
again and saying why there is a specific problem. There we are. That's quality management. Enjoy.